Hello, this is the Stories Beside channel. I release videos every day for you. Subscribe and click the bell. Adriana and her sister were relaxing by the pool, while her parents and her older brother were cooking fish for dinner. The girls loved such days, when they all the family rested. After all, they were a real rarity. The fact was that the Red family owned most of the businesses in town. They also owned several posh hotels, cafes, restaurants, and shopping centers. They owned a huge amount of money. As such, they didn't need anything. Parents, their entire conscious lives were spent working long hours while the children were taken care of by babysitters under the supervision of their grandparents. Michael, the oldest child, is already a big boy. He is 29 years old, so mom and dad are quietly bringing him closer to someday owning this empire and dealing with big money, very big money. Betty and Ethan, his parents for the past four years have been bringing their son up to speed, trying to keep him busy so he can get up to speed as quickly as possible. Michael at first was not particularly eager to go into business. All the same, his whole life was carefree and money would appear in his bank account within minutes of him letting his parents know he needed it. But when he turned 25, his parents decided it was time for him to learn how to earn, not just spend. Michael tried to resist, saying that he did not intend to work in this life, as the money that is in the account and their family, not only enough for him and his sisters for life, but also will remain for the children. All his attempts to get things back on track were in vain. Betty and Ethan were very persistent, so at a certain point there was not a penny left in Michael's account and no new enrollment was coming in. He demanded that his parents give him back his full support, threatened them that he would do something to himself, go into a monastery. But Betty and Ethan were adamant. Mama and Papa told him that from now on he would receive money only as wages, but as we know about the earlier banning of pants and hanging out at the club, Employers do not intend to pay their employees. For two days, Michael did not leave his room, organized a boycott to his parents, but nothing helped. After that time, he left his room in the morning and went to his father's office and said he was ready to start his duties. Betty and Ethan were pleased that their son had made this decision. Sometimes they wondered if nothing could influence him and if it would really be easier for him to go into a convent than to start making money. At first, Michael was entrusted with some minor tasks, sorting mail, confirming the date and time of a meeting with partners, sending faxes, and checking emails. Yes, you could say that initially he was a substitute secretary for his parents. However, they in turn felt that Michael should start at the bottom so that in case of force majeure, he could handle all the tasks. After all, when his parents and started a business together, Without a smart assistant, Michael was reluctant to do business. He did not like that his future depended on his parents. Very often he dreamed that he would develop his own business, not inherit his parents. But there was no choice. In parallel with his work, his father told him about the qualities that labor would be able to develop in him. Michael weakly believed in this, but over time he came to terms with his fate, so he began to take things more seriously. He had to abandon partying, as fatigue knocked him off his feet. Trips to the club were rare and only on weekends. Over time, he noticed that more and more girls were paying attention to him. Michael has never been deprived of female attention due to his financial status. However, even the majors have relationship failures. The small number of girls who were the most dainty for him did not pay attention to him as they had more inflated requirements for men, and they were not interested in one-night stands. However, after Michael started working, everything changed. In secular hangouts, a rumor spread that the young man began to deal with the affairs of the family business. The hair of Berea began to remarkable to himself the views of girls who were previously unavailable to him. It's very hard. His ego, although he knew that the fault is not his inner world, but money. Michael became more serious. Over the years, no one dared to make a cheap, ill-considered joke in his direction. Everyone treated him with respect. And only Adriana and Kathy knew what the young man was really like. With his family around, 
he was revealing himself to outsiders in new ways. He was softer, funnier, with his sisters. He liked to get mad and tease, and they, Kathy adored. He was always waiting for the next weekend with his family. So that work took a back seat. However, that rarely happened. Even now, when they are on vacation as a family, Michael and his parents are standing by the grill and discussing another supply problem. But one thing the girls knew for sure, as soon as they sat down at the table, all this work fuss would fade into the background. And so it was this time. As soon as the meat was ready and the mother put it on a beautiful dish, everyone sat down at a large table on the terrace adjacent to the house. During the meal, the family shared memories and news that were not related to work moments. Michael was the only one who sat in the darker shadows, not letting go of his cell phone. Betty and Ethan had already reprimanded him several times, but the young man didn't react to them at all. There was nothing the parents could do, for their son was no longer the little boy who could be deprived of pocket money or put in a corner. For half an hour, Michael diligently typed messages and then scrutinized the reply from the interlocutor, which came to his phone. When the dialogue ended, the young man mute the phone and put the gadget in his pants pocket. In an instant, Michael went from snob to funnyman. He began poking fun at his sisters. Sometimes his jokes would go so far that he would get a smack from his father. However, everyone knew that Michael was not saying all of this with malice. He loved his sisters very much and never let them hurt anyone, not even himself. Kathy was the middle child in the family. For the past few years, she had been very jealous of Michael's independence. She too wanted to start running the family business as soon as possible. The girl recently turned 22 years old. She is very ambitious and realized one thing, so that her parents would trust her to participate in building the family empire. She must perform at the highest level in her studies. Therefore, Kathy evenings, or even days could not leave her room, spending time for textbooks and methodicals. The syndrome of the excellent girl affected her very strongly. It was not enough that she was the best among her classmates at the university. She wanted to be better than the teachers, even though she knew that the latter were annoyed by it. The girl was not afraid of their anger because she was on a special account among them. Of course, this she owed solely to her parents as they sponsored large sums of money to the institute twice a year. God only knows where the money went to the needs of the educational institution or into someone's pocket. Kathy hoped that her parents and brother would allow her to be involved in family affairs before she graduated from the university. However, the family had a different opinion on the matter. Michael had come to terms with the fact that he would be the sole heir to the business in four years. No, it wasn't that he was greedy and didn't want to share the profits with anyone. It was just that the young man had the notion that a woman couldn't handle such serious business. He was willing to give his sisters as much money as they would need to live a poor life. But he didn't want them anywhere near the empire. Their parents were completely against the girls taking part in the family business. They believed that there was nothing better for them than to relax and be busy building their own families. Betty and Ethan realized that sooner or later their daughters would marry and only then would they be able to participate, but only through their husbands. The men Adriana and Kathy would choose had to be intelligent and successful. Only if they were so, would they be allowed into the business. Otherwise, the families of the daughters would simply receive monthly subsidies for the rest of their lives. I, she wasn't happy with that solution. She was a feminist by nature. She would lose her temper when someone around her questioned women's abilities or said that women should take care of the family. There was nothing demeaning about it for her. So she was always jumping out of her pants, figuratively speaking, to prove her abilities. In return, she always received praise, which was said in a condescending tone, which made her lose her temper even more. Kathy had no intention of getting married and having children in the near future. She was not interested in the young men around her. In her head, she had set herself a barrier that she would be able to jump over and start building her family only when she was allowed to do business. She often took her brother's example, or rather, what he had become over the past four years, but she had outdone herself in that as well. 
became more cold-blooded out of nervousness. She didn't care about the feelings of those around her. Only her own emotions took priority. Because of this, her friends gradually disappeared from her life. The only ones left were those she had known since childhood, who remembered how she used to be, and those hopes that sooner or later everything would return to normal. But Kathy didn't care about those either. She didn't like the fact that most of her surroundings were too dependent on their own feelings and emotions. In her opinion, this quality in people prevented them from making the only right decision that would favorably affect their lives. Kathy sat with a serious expression at the dinner table and bragged to her parents about her successes in hopes of gaining their respect and receiving praise. Betty and Ethan listened to their daughter with smiles, but their tone was still condescending as well. Kathy stepped in even harder. This was clearly not what she had expected. Meanwhile, she sat on the chair with one leg tucked under her. The other was hovering in the air. She was genuinely happy. The girl always looked forward to such meetings. She was never capricious. When her parents or brother started discussing any work issues during the holidays, she realized that it was very difficult to manage an entire empire. Problems or urgent matters could come up any day and at any time. Adriana just waited patiently for her loved ones to finish solving things, because she knew it was only temporary. Because of work, their vacations were rarely interrupted, as parents in most cases always found a solution to problems in the shortest possible time. And I was only 19 years old. But mentally she looked like a grown woman who had already seen life. Her parents were very fond of her. She was the most cheerful and kind child of all three. The girl studied well at the Institute. Unlike Kathy with the syndrome of excellent did not suffer. She didn't care if she was better or not. The main thing for her was to get a good knowledge of law. She chose this specialization because she thought that every person should be legally literate in order not to get hooked by scammers and also to know everything about their rights and responsibilities. Adriana knew that she would not work in her profession. More precisely, that she would not work at all. Unlike Kathy, the girl calmly accepted the fact that her parents and brother did not want the girls to take part in the business. She realized that it was very difficult, and only a shark could survive there, which she was not. Adriana was a romantic girl. She dreamed of having her own family and making a home as soon as possible. She never wanted to work because she saw from her parents. How much time does that take up? Betty and Ethan spent very little time with their children, missing all the important stages of their lives. First steps and words. Going to their first grade graduation. First loves and first breakups. This was all seen only by their babysitters, who sometimes managed to videotape all the significant moments of their lives. The absence of parents in their children's lives greatly alienated them from each other. There wasn't the kind of trust that usually occurs between mom, dad, and child. Adriana remembered it all, and her heart clenched with pain every time she remembered running to the babysitter to tell her the news instead of her mom, for example. She didn't want it to be the same in her family. Adriana realized that her husband would be 100% involved in the family business and would be a rare house guest. So she decided that she would not go to work even if she was forced out. The girl wanted to live all the significant moments of her future children together with them. Therefore, she was already watching various psychological videos that told how to build good and harmonious relations in the family and how to bypass all the obstacles that will arise. According to such a description, one can decide that Adriana was a very calm and cute girl. However, this was not entirely true. Since childhood, she got into all sorts of trouble and also threw herself into a fight with boys. If they managed to say something offensive to her, bumps and bruises followed her throughout her life. Parents were constantly grabbing their heads, tried to hold conversations with the girl, which are able to enlighten her. However, everything was in vain. There was not a single day until she was 14 years old, so that they did not fall into another situation. The daughter's behavior stressed Betty and Ethan, so they tried several times to hire an etiquette teacher who told her how a girl Adriana should behave. Such lectures only served to amuse her, 
since she believed that everyone has the right to behave as they wish, as long as it didn't break the law. Most of all, Adriana resented that her parents were not happy with the way she ate. But they found something to get at, didn't they? You have to eat in a way that tastes good, Adriana thought. It doesn't matter whether the greasy sauce runs down your hands or not, whether the baked goods, the people or not. Of course, at reception she behaved quite differently, because she was not a stupid girl and did not want to make herself look bad. But at home one could eat as one wished. She had always been told that no man would want to live with such a woman. But she disagreed. Adriana dreamed how soon she would meet her love and they would sit together on the homestead, grill kebab, and eat it. So her arms would be up to her elbows in shish kebab and gravy. Yes, they would. And now she was sitting at the table, tucking one leg under herself and devouring a huge fat piece of meat with great pleasure. And her entire t-shirt was dripping with its juices. Adriana caught endless stares from her relatives, who looked strong, but she didn't care at all. Adriana's friend Benjamin was due to visit that day. She had been friends with him since she was a little girl. He lived in their upscale community in the house next door. It was with him that she got into all sorts of trouble. They were friends to the extent that they were able to confide even their deepest secrets to each other. Benjamin is a little older than Adriana. In about a month from now, he will turn 23 years old. He has always loved to spend all his free time with this girl. She never gets bored. Find adventures, not Adriana, not Benjamin. There was no need for anyone else, since they complemented each other completely. If one of them was sad, the other was always looking for ways to cheer up. They could laugh together, cry together, and get punched in the neck for their mischief. Sometimes, Benjamin felt as if he were experiencing something more than friendship. At such moments, he thought about what would happen if the girl became his life partner. Of course, all of his fantasies were both rainbow and ethereal. There was never a bad twist in his scenarios. Fate. After such musings, Benjamin had more than once thought of suggesting that they not date. There were several times when a young man had already bought a beautiful bouquet of flowers, planned the evening. He was ready to propose to the girl to go to the next level of the relationship, but at the last moment he threw it. What he feared most in life was that he might lose Adriana forever if she did not have the same feelings for him as he did. For the past three years, he had always suppressed the appearance of thoughts of loving her. Benjamin wanted to keep what he already had. Betty and Ethan were not very welcoming of the friendship with Benjamin. Of course, this was due to the fact that it was with this young man that their daughter was getting into various scrapes. They blamed the young man for the fact that it is he who provokes the girl to rash actions. They did not realize that things were exactly the opposite. And since this thought did not penetrate their heads, Benjamin was to blame for everything. In addition, the young man was the son of. This family was a competitor for Red. The Flanagans were also developing their empire. In their small town, so did the Red family. They were engaged in business activities in various fields. Their cafes and hotel restaurants were second to none in quality of service. They always went toe to toe, constantly conflicted with each other. And then by chance, their children became best friends. Benjamin's parents weren't thrilled with his choice of best friend either. But unlike Betty and Ethan, they never told their son who he should be friends with and who he should shun. Benjamin was very grateful for this, as he knew that Adriana did not live an easy life in a world of constant inhibitions. The girl often complained to him about her parents' cautionary speeches, even if they applied to him as well. As the family dinner was nearing its end, the Red family heard the bell ring. Adriana quickly jumped up and ran to the gate as she knew it was Benjamin coming. Her parents and brother and sister only rolled their eyes, not understanding what she found in this young man. Betty and Ethan often thought that she might give Benjamin some of the secrets of the family business, which he, in turn, would pass on to his parents and his competitors. Just from this thought alone, they were ready to lose their temper and go to screaming to try to convince Adriana to stop being friends with Benjamin. In the meantime, and it is necessary, ran to the gate 
and having opened it, threw herself on Benjamin's neck. The young man hugged her back. From the outside, they looked as if they hadn't seen each other for years, even though they had just this morning gone biking together. But thank God, Benjamin, what took you so long? You missed the whole dinner. I really wanted you to sit with us. Hello, my dear friend. I'm sorry, what happened? I really tried my best to come as early as possible, but all the circumstances were such that I was free only now. The girl stood with a serious face with her hands at her sides and without taking her eyes off the young man, and she clearly didn't believe what he was saying. She understood why things had turned out the way they had. She wanted to hear it from her friend though, and she hated being lied to or not told something. Admit it, you just didn't want to come, and you delayed it on purpose. Adriana, what are you talking about? It wasn't like that. But you know your parents aren't exactly thrilled that I'm here. I think if I sat at the same table with you, they'd feel uncomfortable at the very least. I know these family days are pretty rare for you guys, so I just didn't want to spoil it. Benjamin, I completely understand all of this. I don't care how my parents, my brother and sister feel. I want them to accept that we'll be together forever, and our friendship is unbreakable. It blows my mind that after all these years, they still can't get over it. Adriana, I mean, that's what parents are. They'll always worry about you. That's just you, my family, and I know you're not in any danger. Your family doesn't think so. They think that if our families are rivals, then someone's bound to get hurt physically or mentally. It's like we're two rival mafia clans. After these words, Adriana rolled in laughter, took Benjamin by the hand, and led him to the table. The faces of the parents were very confused, as they hoped that the young man would not dare to disturb their rest. Nevertheless, each of them realized that it was necessary to portray a cordial and welcoming manner. On the faces of the parents appeared strained smiles, and Michael and Kathy did not even raise their eyes to the guest. Hello, Benjamin. What brings you here? Betty greeted her daughter's friend. Did you come here just for fun or with some news? Yes, hello. I'm very happy to see you. Actually, they invited me over for dinner. Unfortunately, I couldn't make it in time. Oh, really? Don't you know it's not proper to be late? Of course, knowing Adriana, I warned her right away that I probably wouldn't be able to make it by the appointed time. Then she told me to come when I had the chance. I finished my business and went straight to you because I missed Adriana so much. Benjamin, but you only saw her this morning. We went biking together. My dad joined the conversation. Oh, that was when. It's been 100 years. By the way, she and I never even called or texted each other after that. Believe me, that rarely happens to us. Yeah, we noticed Adriana was off the phone too. Okay, Kathy's gonna make you some coffee and you tell us what's new. Yeah, there's not really any news. I heard Fox finally moved to our town. My parents are always freaking out about it. Fox what? Did Betty and Ethan yell? Yeah, what's the big deal? That crook wants to take away some of our business. I think that's what your parents are nervous about. He can't get enough of everything. Why would he move to our small town from out of state, only to steal from our empire? Benjamin looked at his indignant parents, and they looked at him with a kind of bewilderment. He did not realize that some fox wanted to grab a part of Red and Flanagan's business. It was the first time the young man had heard of this character. He felt that if he had been told anything about him before, he would know why his parents were so alarmed by the man's arrival, and he would also understand the reason for Adriana's parents' resentment. The young men looked at each other. Adriana took Benjamin's hand and told his parents that she was going out. This time Betty and Ethan did not oppose it at all, as their heads were full of other things. The young people headed towards the gate and soon disappeared behind it. Ethan, do you even realize what's going on? Why are you sitting so still? Why am I sitting so still? I'm just like you, I just found out Fox is coming. You expect me to make a decision and act in five seconds. Okay, I'm sorry, honey, I really overreacted. 
the first thing we need to do is calm down. At that moment, Ethan threw Betty a look. Okay, the first thing I need to do is calm down, if it makes you feel better. Yeah, the second thing is to find out why he came here. No, that's not the question at all. Why did he move here? Look, but maybe he was just drawn to nature. Yeah, that's why he chose the second most populous city in the region. If he was drawn to nature, he'd go to the country or the woods. Honey, I'm sorry. I'm just thinking stupid thoughts in my head. I just want to stop thinking as soon as possible that he moved here to steal from us. Do you have any idea how scared I am? This is such a dangerous man. I'm scared for our children, or rather, I'm scared for our girls. Don't worry. We're not gonna hurt the girls. I think the first thing we should do is talk to Flanagan, not Foxy. We need to find out what they know about his arrival. Maybe they know the real reasons, and only after that conversation can we move forward. Ethan, how do you think we're gonna talk to them? Have you completely forgotten that we're competitors? Betty, we're competitors who could be at the bottom in a second. And at the bottom, as you realize, there are no competitors. Everyone's equal. Do you want to go to the bottom? I don't. At that moment, Ethan took his cell phone out of his pants pocket and started looking for the phone number of the head of the Flanagan family. Once he found it, the man froze for a few seconds. It was clear from the look on his face that he didn't feel like calling at all, but the circumstances were such that they had to stick together. When Ethan pressed the call button, there was silence in the room. It seemed to take forever. In fact, he got an answer after the second ring. Go ahead. There was a pleasant male voice on the other end of the line. William, good afternoon. This is Ethan Red. Don't get distracted. Hello, Ethan. Why am I introducing myself? I have your number on my cell phone. I realize we're competitors, but we're still reasonable adults. Anything can happen. Can I help you? Yeah, you're right. I'm just making a habit of introducing myself. Michael's in charge of calling partners and clients. They don't even know what I look like or talk like anymore. William, you heard Fox is here. Of course I did. How did you hear about it? Ethan realized that Benjamin had probably said too much and shouldn't turn him and parents needed to come up with a story right away. But prolonged silence could arouse suspicion. William, but you know this is a small town. Word travels fast. That's why I called you, to clarify, since I've heard it on the gossip level. Yeah, it's true. I suggest we get together, discuss it. This is exactly the time when we need to bury the hatchet and start working together. The words of William Flanagan sang, It is true that no entrepreneur can resist a giant like Fox, even if he has already built an empire in the city. In such a case, you need to rally together and think carefully about a plan. What did you do with these two men who were competitors until recently? The meeting was set for the same day. It was agreed that women, although they have a big part in the development of the business, not to take wives and daughters could spoil everything due to their emotionality. No one opposed this decision. No one except Kathy. The girl was literally losing her temper, proving to her father and brother that they were again infringing on women's rights. She was sure that she would show herself at the negotiations only on the best side. But Ethan and Michael stood their ground. It was time to act. The men went to the house to change. They chose casual suits in a classic style. The meeting was informal, so they could do without ties. After 20 minutes, they were ready, got into the Jeep, and headed to the restaurant where the meeting was scheduled. The facility was not owned by either Red or Flanagan. It was neutral territory. Ethan's Jeep was parked at the entrance. Once inside, the man found that there was no one in the room and only two men sitting at one table. They were William and Benjamin. It turned out that Flanagan Sr. had specifically reserved the entire restaurant for three o'clock so that no one could interrupt or overhear their conversation. William Manor raised his hand and invited the men to their table. To be honest, Ethan was a little offended by such a gesture that this Flanagan was allowing himself. Is he calling for waiters? Forgot who was in front of him. 
when the rage inside was starting to boil over. Ethan took several deep breaths and slow exhalations. He needed to calm down and become less picky about the members of this family. Michael was most surprised to see Benjamin at this meeting. After all, the young man had gone for a walk with his sister only 40 minutes ago. He wondered how in that time Flanagan Jr. had managed to get home, change his clothes, and get here. He really wanted to ask that question, but he decided to restrain his curiosity. Hello, gentlemen. It's been a long time since we've seen each other in person like this. Yes, William, it has. How do you do? I hope you don't mind me bringing my son. He's been a big part of our business development for the last four years, so he has every right to know what he's up against. Of course I don't mind. You see, I'm not alone either. Benjamin has only recently started working for me, but he too must be prepared for anything. I understand that Michael, like Benjamin, has no idea. Who's Fox? No, I was hoping he wouldn't have to face him in real life. So I didn't tell them, to be honest. Michael was not very interested in the development of our businesses and establishments at first. At that moment, I tried to give him only positive information. But now he has matured, become more serious and wise. It's time to realize that the reality is not as smooth as we'd like it to be. You're right. Shall we begin? After these words, William Flanagan began to tell everything he knew about Fox. Earlier, there had been rumors going around town that he was moving in with them. The women were ecstatic because he was a single man and overly wealthy. The men, on the other hand, had their tails between their legs. William had to believe in the truth of these rumors only yesterday when he received a call on his phone from Noah Fox himself. He couldn't believe it. The last time they had talked was at least seven years ago, when Noah had set his eyes on his transportation company and tried to squeeze it out by all means. It should be noted that Noah had always acted legally, well, or near legally. No criminality. At that point, William was grabbing all the connections he could at the time. They almost succeeded in proving that Fox was going to take something that didn't belong to him. However, police officers and lawyers were afraid of Noah, and no one risked pressing charges against him. These rumors reached the regional city. At some point, the regional prosecutor called Noah and told him what was in store for him if he did not calm down. The men were longtime friends, so Fox decided to listen and settle down. This time when he called William, he didn't go around. Yes, about. The man got straight to the point. Noah said he'd gotten crowded in the regional town, wanted to move to a place where life was so vibrant and people didn't know him. Fool, why are you making up stories? How can people not know you when your face is on TV all day long? Thought to himself, Flanagan Sr. Fox informed William that he was going to expand his business and casually mentioned that he was very interested in the Flanagan and Red properties. At this point, William realized that he was in the biggest trouble he had ever been in. Noah never just said anything. If he said he liked those objects, it meant that he would do anything to get them. This is 100% information. Even if you are a single mother with five young children on your hands, and this business allows you to live a normal life, and is your only income, he will still take it away. You see, Noah Fox has never been known for kindness, humanity, or mercy. This man doesn't have his heart where it should be, stands a bill, a successor. If his account balance has increased, he'll be a little softer than a rock. So you won't be in any pain at all. Deal with him. The expression on Ethan's face changed. The man clearly realized that things were much worse than originally thought. Flanagan and Red began to discuss a possible solution to this unpleasant matter. It was no small matter. The issue was not unpleasant, but catastrophic. If what Fox hoped would happen happened, the two families would lose tens of one billion of their monthly income. At some point, the men's quiet conversation turned into an argument in raised tones. The waiters became uncomfortable and fled to the back rooms. Only the security guard remained in the hall who was already on guard, as he was convinced that a fight was about to break out. The doors to the restaurant swung open, 
William Flanagan was about to cause a scandal, as he had specifically rented all the establishments so that no one could interrupt them. When he looked up, he saw a familiar silhouette, his mouth dry and his throat tight. He couldn't believe his eyes. Noah Fox was entering the restaurant, followed by a young man whose face he couldn't make out because the bright evening sun was scattering its rays behind him. As the man came closer, William and Ethan realized that behind Noah's back was Jacob, his son. The young man was a complete carbon copy of his father. His long pointed nose and chin made his appearance speak, the way a trickster looks, which he is, eyes bright blue. The people around him sometimes felt as if they were afraid of the candlelight, because no one had ever seen Radu like him before in their lives. Jacob was dressed in a stylish suit gray color white shirt, and around his neck was a red tie. His face was haughty. Jacob knew that now his father was eating up these small business shirts that had managed to establish themselves quite well in this small town. So all gathered together in such pleasant company, and we haven't been honored to be with you. Noah Fox started the conversation. A mocking smile appeared on his face. Well, it's not right. It's indecent. They are all newcomers to your city, you might say your colleagues. And you ignore us so coldly. You haven't been taught any etiquette at all. Noah, hello, replied Alec Flanagan. We were just sitting around deciding where to invite you. We wanted to gather with families. As you can see, we have no wives and daughters with us. There's no way we'd ignore you coming or moving. We did, didn't we? Have we become uncomfortable in the region? Noise and noise. People don't let us take a step. We decided to change the situation a little and settle down in the entrepreneurial plan in the new city. Ethan, how is your hotel business doing? Noah, not much. You know what I mean. It's not a resort town. No big influx of tourists. The hotels make a steady, small profit. Really? Well, I think you're cheating me out of my money. Oh, it's not nice of Ethan to cheat on his friends. Jacob and I are here for you wholeheartedly. I heard that your hotels are not really in demand among foreign tourists, and rooms must be booked at least two months in advance. So your profit margin is just what I need. What do you mean? There was a lump in Ethan's throat that prevented him from asking the question in a confident tone. His voice was a little muffled. I want your hotel business. I think we'll make a deal. Noah, I don't think I can sell it to you. I'm not the only one in the business. Michael and Betty are too. These things don't just happen overnight. Basically, we need to get a family council together. I never said I wanted to buy it from you. You see, I need to get a foothold in your town, and I don't want to start a business from scratch. Have you forgotten, Ethan, that Ethan didn't know what Fox was talking about? What's he supposed to remember? Forget how 20 years ago your business was on the verge of bankruptcy, and I loaned you a large sum of money. How could you do that? You said you'd remember it forever. It hasn't been that long. Wait a minute, Noah. I do remember everything. What you don't remember is that after six months, I paid it all back. You're right, you got every penny back, but no more. Is that how it works in big business? No, Ethan, that's what the six months were about. And you never thought to pay it back. That's 20 years worth of interest. You never said anything about interest. At the time, you said you were giving me the money with no strings attached. Isn't that right? Because interest is so commonplace that no one ever mentions it. Because that's the way it's supposed to be. Wow. So I didn't pay you interest, and you waited 20 years to take it. I'm in the hotel business. Are you out of your mind? Ethan was starting to lose his temper. He realized that Fox's arrival would cause problems for his family but he couldn't have guessed that the problems would be of such a huge scale. The man was holding himself together with the last of his strength, so as not to lose his brand and trample his reputation by his own efforts. William Flanagan at this time sat relaxed. Since Noah Fox had not yet said anything to him, he hoped that the fate of being robbed would pass him by. However, as soon as a faint smile appeared on his face, Noah turned to him William 
You have a very good cafe chain from the circus. So many delicious dishes. I read your tax returns and marveled at how such a small business can make such an impressive profit. That's impressive. At that moment, William tried to replay in his head the memories when he had borrowed money from Fox or when the latter had done him any favor that could have a big impact on his life. But he remembered nothing. As it happened, William and Noah were only fighting and competing, nothing more. William did not cross him as that would only make things worse. A nervous smile appeared on his face. What are you trying to remember that you owe me? You owe me your good attitude, Noah said smiling, but you and I also have a warm, friendly relationship. So let's show and tell everyone. I will gladly accept this modest gift from you and your family. Noah, are you trying to leave us all pantsless? William suddenly shrieked. But why no pants? You have a lot of businesses, and I think that for the years of our friendship I can get you such a small gift from Ethan. The men stood in utter bewilderment. It could not have occurred to anyone that Fox's wishes would be measured on such an enormous scale. William and Ethan had thought that he would simply be bilking them out of large sums of money. But what was he going to take away? What have they spent their lives developing? Half their lives, no one could have guessed. Benjamin and Michael stood silent. Flanagan Jr. did not dare to open his mouth because he was very green in business and did not know how to solve the problems that Fox had brought down on their heads. The young man decided to adopt this silent tactic and not interfere with his father's decision that could change their way of life. Of course, if William had given away his cafe chain, their family would not have become destitute overnight. They'd still be rich. It was just that the income would be a little less. Michael, meanwhile, was also silent, but not because he was afraid of ruining everything, but because he was trying to understand what Fox needed from them. The young man guessed that it wouldn't be long before Noah made a suggestion. If Flanagan and Red agreed to it, everyone's empires would be intact. But the stakes were too high, which meant that the offer was not going to be the most palatable. But looking at Jacob Fox, he realized that he too was somehow involved in this. There were one million thoughts in his head, but inside was the firm conviction that none of them were true. Don't say anything. Guys interrupted the silence. Fox Sr. afraid to hear what else you have to offer us, replied Ethan. Suggestion. The only option I can think of is to leave your empires in this city. Interesting to hear. Scary interesting, William replied, emphasizing the first word. They were all really scared, for the stakes were high. Well, your problems are solved with just one good decision. You see, Ethan. Noah turned to the head of the Red family. Your daughter happens to be popular with the opposite sex. I don't know what it is about her, but she's certainly got a lot of energy. You wouldn't believe it. My son couldn't resist her at that moment. Jacob had a satisfied smile on his face. It happens, Noah. Who better than you to say the heart can't do what the heart says? How many times has he changed his own? It happens, but I always got what I wanted and my son should learn that from me. Get what you want, no matter what. Now, Jacob wants your daughter. Ethan, what can I do to help? They probably go to the same parties. All Jacob has to do is walk up and strike up a conversation, Ethan replied. He didn't want his daughter to get involved with the Fox family. But you can't talk like that in their presence. I approached her, but she didn't talk to me very enthusiastically, Jacob interjected. I don't intend to dance around her either, you know. Fox, and you don't do that. I just need her. Ethan, don't you have any idea where we're going with this? Peter asked. Frankly speaking, I don't understand what you want and why you came here, threatening to take away our businesses. Your daughter is to be my son's wife. Don't worry. He won't touch her until she's married. He'll be fine for a week. What did Michael shout? What wife? What week? Can't my daughter choose her own husband as a regular legal wife? Why are you looking at me like that? Your eyes will fall out of your orbits and you won't be able to pick them up and milk off your own milk. He's a little excited at the news his sister's marrying such a prominent bachelor. Noah, 
How can I promise they'll get married if Adriana has to make that decision herself? She's a woman. The decisions she has to make are what dress to wear and what lipstick to wear. For everything else, she has to rely on the opinion of the older men in her family. This conversation is starting to bore me. You have two o'clock to give me an answer. Otherwise, you will lose your children. Noah, I'm sorry. William got involved in the conversation. How does Ethan's decision affect my business? The thing is, Alesha, Adriana is not a distraction from your Benjamin. If she marries Jacob, your son must hide in the gloom and not come closer to her than 100 meters. Yeah, we're all good with that. Fox Sr. in the Medi is revived. No, Betty, you don't want to ask me. Started shouting Benjamin. Comrades from Fox, how do you think I should give up the man I've known all my conscious life? There's nothing between us, so why am I a threat to you? And let me ask you, what century are we living in? What kind of primitive society is this? Not a living human being with feelings and emotions, so why should she do something that's against her will? Because she's a woman, she's not naturally capable of making good decisions. I don't understand, you don't like it. You want to perform. Be careful. Because the consequences of your stubbornly stubbornness are what I outlined earlier. At this point, William pulled Benjamin back, showing that he'd better shut his mouth and accept Fox's terms of play. Noah, don't worry, don't mind my son. He's still young. Despite his age, the blood in his veins is boiling. I subdued him. He'll be quieter than the grass. Look, William, on your own responsibility. I don't really want to mess with spit and get my hands dirty, so to speak, Noah said in a stern tone. Ethan, I expect an answer from you tonight. If it doesn't come, we'll have to share. My friends, Noah and Jacob at the same moment turned around and walked towards the exit. The remaining men in the room sat there looking lost, and only Benjamin's face showed a look of rage and aggression. A flame was raging inside him. It was as if a volcano was preparing to erupt. He didn't understand why his father was so afraid of Fox that he was ready to close his son's mouth. Was there no control over this man? Apparently there wasn't. He had heard that in recent years, all high-ranking officials had resigned and Fox's relatives and close friends had taken their places. Against such a man, no one could dare to go against him. Be it a policeman, a tax inspector, or even a prosecutor, no matter how hard Benjamin strained his meanderings, he could not quickly come up with a plan to save Adriana. He couldn't imagine his life without her. After all, his feelings for this girl were more than just friendship. Deep down, the young man dreamed that he and Adriana would be together. And if his parents could, and if his parents could accept his choice, Betty and Ethan would do anything to prevent it. They didn't care how their daughter would feel. They needed to satisfy their own ambitions. As it was now, Benjamin was 100%. I'm sure Ethan would accept Fox's offer without hesitation, just to avoid losing a piece of the business. In doing so, the Flanagan family would be intact and their wealth would remain the same. While Benjamin was thinking, he did not even notice that they had already arrived home. A worried mother stood on the doorstep. William silently approached her took her by the hand and led her to his study. The young man did not follow them. He did not want to be present at this conversation. He entertained the hope that Adriana's parents would not agree to this scam. It was impossible. How could you sell out a human being for your material needs? Ethan and Michael drove home in complete silence. The young man's mind was racing with thoughts. He was trying to think of a plan to keep their empire intact, but not to keep his sister's independence. Ethan was morally ready to go along with Fox's terms. He was just working out a speech in his head that would convince his women that it was the only way out of this situation. Adriana, Kathy and Betty were in the yard. Mom was bathing the flower beds, tidying them up. Kathy was doing yoga rather than reading a book. The women didn't immediately notice that their men had only returned when Ethan about K wandered in. They took their eyes off their own business and made their way toward the men. None of them said a word. 
Everyone was scared. Adriana wasn't scared. She just didn't want to look too frivolous in front of the others. So she adopted the tactics of her mother and older sister. I'll tell you right away, Ethan started talking. Things aren't going too well. Fox came to our town with only one goal, and if he doesn't achieve it, we'll lose our hotel business. And the Flanagan family is in a chain of coffee shops. The stakes are pretty high, so Noah's demands are very serious. What? But how come, Nathan? There's got to be some kind of control over him. It's impossible that this man's life is rife with permissiveness. Betty's worried. I've made up my mind. We're not accepting any of his demands. We refer. We go straight to the prosecutor's office. No to the regional prosecutor's office. Betty, calm down. Nothing will really help here. What prosecutor's office? Have you forgotten who he is? The regional prosecutor. Do you want us to lose our pants altogether? Dad, what condition did Fox set you? Ask Kathy with a clever look, who took the whole conversation as a business proposal from which everyone should benefit. It's the hardest thing to panic. Ethan said in a low voice, shifting his eyes to Adriana. The girl's heart clenched. Never in her life had her father looked at her with such sadness. Well, I'll tell you right away that what I'm about to say is not up for discussion. The decision has been made. Adriana, why didn't you ever tell me that Jacob was paying you any attention? If I knew who it was, maybe I would have. Who is he? And what does that have to do with him? Jacob, Noah Fox's son. Turns out he's been in love with you for a long time. He's tried to get your attention a few times, but you've been soft on him the whole time. You see, he's got such a deep crush on you that the young man can't think of anything else but you. Okay, that's certainly nice. But if he didn't respond to me, he wasn't attracted to me. What does this have to do with you meeting New and Foxy today? Directly. Now I'll tell you about Fox's offer and my decision. Ethan hesitated. It hurt him to say those words. In a week's time, you will marry Jacob. And tomorrow night is the engagement party. Period. What a chorus of screams. Betty. Adriana and Kathy. That's it, no arguments. We've never brought you into the family business, but now you can do a huge favor to keep our wealth intact. Don't worry, you're gonna be rolling in the dough. You know how much money Fox makes, right? Are you kidding me? Dad, tell me you're kidding, and it's just a prank. Daddy's getting hysterical. Adriana, you're willing to get rid of one member of your family just to make more money. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Michael intervened. Calm down, I said Adriana. What's so terrible about you getting married now? I don't understand your outrage. Jacob, good looking, not ugly. Even I'd say he's a handsome young man with a great deal of wealth in his account. Are you stupid? Don't you realize that everyone would like to be in your shoes? When I meet him in clubs, I see that girls are hoarding him and all he thinks about is you. Do you realize what a happy married life you'll have? He's gonna blow the dust off you. What do I care how many girls he's got hanging all over him? I don't care about him. Have you ever thought about me getting into bed with him? How I'd feel in that moment? Or do you not give a damn either? That's what Ethan yelled. And I said from the beginning that it's not up for discussion. And go to your room and start getting cleaned up. Mom will pick out your dress for tomorrow night. Mom, why didn't you say something? She cried out, not looking at her mother. I think I'm right about everything. He's never made a wrong decision in his life. If he said that you will be good with Jacob, then it will be so. No tears have accumulated in his eyes. The girl usually never cried, but now there was no strength to hold back. She snapped out of her seat and ran into the house. So on the fresh lawn left footprints, as if she was like wearing soccer cleats with spikes. Adriana ran as hard as she could, but she felt like a turtle. She wasn't ready to accept her father's decision. It's her life. How could anyone else control it? Only she had the right to do so. The girl realized no one would let her out of the house. She knew the secret passage. It was hidden not only from prying eyes, 
but also from the video cameras that were hung all over the homestead. Adriana texted Benjamin half an hour later at our cafe without waiting for a reply, ran to her room to change and pack. She assumed she would have to flee the city today, to where she herself didn't realize, taking money from her stash. She headed for the backyard. There, a month ago, the wind had ripped off a metal profile that was easy to push back and get into the neighbor's lot. She wasn't afraid of the neighbors. They knew Adriana used it periodically to escape her parents' overprotective behavior. It took no more than 20 minutes to walk to the cafe, but the girl made it in 10. Apparently, adrenaline gave her strength, and she could not move in measured steps. Entering the cafe, Adriana was surprised to notice Benjamin at the table, as if he was sitting there. When she texted him, the young man twitched his leg nervously. She realized that her friend was aware of what was going on. Why had she called him? Adriana realized that it was pointless to expect any serious help from Benjamin. She just wanted to share her emotions and tell him that she was leaving. Benjamin, I'm so glad you were sitting up when I texted you. No, it's just that right after you texted me, I jumped in the car and drove here. Figured I'd rather wait for you than be late. At that moment, a call came in on her cell phone. When she looked, she saw it was her father. The girl dropped it, but a few seconds later, a call came from her mother. Then she decided to disconnect the phone so that it would not bother her and fray her nerves. Are the parents concerned about the tone? Asked Benjamin. Yes, that's how she disconnected the phone. Benjamin, do you even know what condition Fox made to my father? Of course I know, guiltily, replied the young man. I was at the meeting with them. I'm horrified at how a grown man could come to that inference. I hope your father thinks it over and refuses. No, Benjamin, he has thought it through and agreed. I don't know how he doesn't feel guilty about selling his own daughter already. He's already thought it over and decided to marry you off to that smug turkey. Yeah, I guess he had enough of the 15-minute car ride home. And my mother says we should trust my father because he's never made a decision in his life that reflects negatively on us. But I don't understand why she thinks my life of suffering would be considered a pleasure to her. By the way, Fox made some kind of condition on you too. He wanted a piece of your business too. What was your condition? Benjamin hesitated. He didn't feel comfortable talking about it. He didn't want Adriana to feel obliged or guilty. After all, the conditions that Flanagan had set required minimal or no action on Benjamin's part. Adriana, our condition is that I disappear from your life and never show up again. What? So not only do they want to marry me off, they want me to form a new neighborhood. Are they crazy? Why do you have to disappear? What's in your way? They think you and I are too close. Sooner or later, our friendship can grow into something more. What the hell is he breathing out? Said Adriana, leaning back in her chair. They should see a doctor. They're all sick in there. No, it's not crazy. It's Adriana. What do you mean? Oh, of course, I wasn't prepared for this conversation. Adriana, you and I have known each other all our adult lives. I've never met anyone who was better for me than you. I started to notice a long, long time ago that I was drawn to you as a woman, not a friend. Unexpectedly, why am I hearing about this for the first time? I have no right to know how you feel. Yes, you do. It's just that I was afraid you'd be afraid you'd reject me. If that happened, I wouldn't have a friend or a girlfriend. I decided I'd rather have a bird in my hand. And he did. Look at that husband, Lana. And she didn't start yelling at the whole place. Benjamin had a look of bewilderment on his face. He did not understand why his confession caused such a reaction. Don't you all care how I feel? I'm your plaything. Then I'll tell you something, and then you can live with it. My darling Benjamin, you must realize that our entire friendship was not just based on liking you as a person. I've been in love with you since I was a little girl. Yes, I didn't say that because I was taught that the first step should come from a young man. But you, you see, chose the tit for tat. Adriana jumped up, grabbed her backpack, and was about to run away, as long as she was not in the company of traitors. 
She couldn't believe that all these years her feelings for Benjamin had been mutual, but he'd turned out to be a rare coward. All that time they could spend in each other's arms and feel supported. As she turned to leave, Benjamin grabbed her left wrist. Wait, what did you say? I can't believe it. So you're telling me that jumping Tarzan, you weren't afraid to get into a kid fight. You weren't afraid to break windows to people who pissed you off. You weren't afraid, but you were afraid to say how you felt. No, you were afraid to open up and tell me how you felt. I was just waiting for you to make the first move. It's not proper for a lady to talk about her feelings. A young man might think she's imposing, and I didn't mean it that way. It's not proper for a lady. What are you saying? Benjamin burst out laughing. You're a fool, you're so mature. How could you hide it your whole life? Jesus, what kind of shit have we gotten ourselves into? It's nothing like that. I'll leave now, and then you'll come back, and everything will be better than ever. No, you can't leave. It could get worse. They could find you and do bad things. We don't want that. I thought of something while I was waiting for you here. I'll tell you all about it, and then you can go home and get ready for the engagement party. You're crazy enough to think you can run my life. What kind of traitors are around calm down and you listen to me? Benjamin forcefully sat Adriana back in the chair. The young man came up with a plan to save Adriana 100%. He wasn't sure of it, but 100% sure it was better than letting things go to waste. The girl listened to him attentively, occasionally resenting him and calling him crazy. As soon as Benjamin stopped talking, Adriana thought about it and decided that this was the best plan. She hadn't heard any other though. As soon as they agreed on everything, she was ready to resent it. But then she felt that such power from Benjamin made her body tremble. She loved it. Adriana headed home on her own so as not to draw attention to her friend, the way he could get into trouble. Where have you been? Do you even have a conscience? Mom started yelling from the doorstep. Why is your phone off? How could you leave without permission before such an important event? Mom, you think that after such wonderful news I didn't need some time to think things over. You could have done it in your room. I thought you were in there crying. I came to comfort you and there was no sign of you. Okay, that's why I left, because I knew you wouldn't leave me alone. Stop yelling. I'm here. I'm ready to marry your smug turkey. What more do you want? It'd be nice if you'd change your tone to a calmer one and start acting like a Foxham family. I have to go rob someone. Adriana, how many times? These are respectable people. I can see how respectable they are that everyone around here is tucking their tails. It's okay. I've had my say and I'm ready for my fitting. Did you get your dress ready for the party tomorrow night? Betty nodded contentedly, took Adriana's hand and led her to her room. When they entered, the girl was speechless. Half of her room was furnished with hangers filled with dresses of different styles. Adriana was not very well versed in fashion trends but she realized that in front of her were outfits from famous designers. Under any other circumstances, the girl would have started resisting the outfit choice, as she was not at all eager to marry Fox Jr. However, her and Benjamin's plan was precisely that she should blow dust in the eyes of the in-laws. Betty swirled around her daughter, relentlessly applying one projectile or the other to her, and she pretended as if the process gave her great pleasure. In principle, she didn't care what kind of dress she wore, and she didn't want it to be something inexpensive since the outfit would be ruined. She just felt sorry for the money her parents would spend on her. But then the girl remembered thanks to whom she was in this trap and chose the most expensive one that was presented. Betty was a little surprised by the choice because this dress was not at all to her daughter's taste, but it looked amazing on Adriana's figure, so her mother accepted her choice. Betty and Ethan were ready to spend a lot of money on this party, just so that their life would remain the same. However, the girl couldn't understand how life would be the same if one child was just yanked out of their family. They would pretend they never had one, or they'll entertain the thought that it's only for a couple of years, for now where Kathy is playing. And the girl's broken fate 
is completely out of anyone's mind. After the dress was chosen, Betty took Adriana to her dressing room where her jewelry was kept in a safe. They were exquisite handmade pieces from renowned jewelers. By selling them, the Red family could completely buy out the houses in their upscale community. Adriana had never seen all of her mother's jewelry in one place before. Her eyes went wild at the sheer variety. Emeralds, rubies, diamonds. However, the girl's eyes stopped on the amethyst. A lilac transparent stone that held something magical, according to Adriana. At least that's what the books she read said. In just a few hours, Adriana was fully prepared for tomorrow's event. Her mother was running around her with a joyful look, as if she was willingly and lovingly marrying the man she had been waiting for all her life. The girl tried with all her might to pretend, as if she had nothing against the engagement and subsequent wedding. Toward nightfall, she could no longer pretend. Tears were constantly coming to her eyes, and her mother and father could not leave her alone. When her parents finally let her go, she headed to her room, collapsed on her bed with all her might, and began to sob. Adriana tried not to make a single sound so as not to attract attention from outside. She didn't want to see anyone from her family, as it was believed that they had all betrayed her. When the tears were over, she picked up her phone to text Benjamin. The young man did not respond to her messages for a long time. Adriana began to worry. She thought he had decided to backtrack, and tomorrow's plan would fail. It was about an hour or so until the young man replied to her Benjamin, said he was near his parents the whole time and his phone was in his pocket, but silently so nothing could draw attention to it. Benjamin was sure that tomorrow everything would go smoothly. He was sure that they wouldn't ask, but would do everything as they had agreed. Benjamin's support helped Adriana to come to her senses a little, but inside her there was a real storm of emotions. Nothing helped her to calm down. Along with her worries came insomnia. The girl in the depths of her soul dreamed that today's night would fly very quickly this ill-fated day would come, and she would have to endure only a few hours before everything would be solved. However, her body had completely different plans. Her heart refused to calm down, increasing its revolutions. Her brain was constantly churning out crazy thoughts about how tomorrow's engagement might unfold if things didn't go according to plan. Adriana tried to chase those thoughts away. Away, breathing deeply and slowly to push the anxiety away. But it didn't help for more than 10 or 15 minutes. At some point, Adriana realized that it was already getting light outside the window. In just three o'clock, her mom was going to wake her up. The girl had already decided that she would not try to go to bed at all. But then she thought that she might make some mistakes in the evening because of her tiredness. Adriana put a pillow on her head to keep the light out of her eyes. She began to read a poem, barely audible in a whisper. At some point, she began to sink into the bottomless void that took her into the realm of morphine. And she did not wake up from the fact that her mother shook her and began to scream louder and louder. The girl came to as if she had passed out abruptly and opened her eyes wide, taking in a large amount of air with her mouth. Mom, what the hell are you doing? With indignation, the girl muttered indignantly, I can't wake you up. For 10 minutes now, I've been scared. I feel like you've been messing with me on purpose. So what I said is what you call bullying. I'm sorry, mom, that the media has the same desires at night and in the morning as you do. Adriana sneered. That's enough. Come on, get ready, come out for breakfast. There's a car coming to pick us up in 200 hours. I don't get it. What car? Isn't this where we're having our engagement party? Of course not. How could you even think that yesterday while you were on the run? Dad and I found a gorgeous place that would be perfect for the event. Can I ask you more about what this place is? Betty told her daughter that the event would be held in one of the best banquet halls. It was a large area with a flower garden, mowed lawn, installed fountains, and statues. The place was quite picturesque, yet this establishment was owned by the Flanagan family. That's how fate had played a cruel joke on Danya. In her distant childhood, she dreamed that their marriage ceremony with Benjamin would be held there. It was the most beautiful place she had ever seen in the city. 
Now her dream would be overshadowed. The girl timely thought about the fact that it is necessary to notify Benjamin about the change of venue of the engagement party. After all, their plan was that the event would be held at Red's house. When her mom left the room, the girl immediately grabbed the phone and dialed her lover's number. When Benjamin picked up the phone, it was clear that he was anxious about something. It turned out that he was already aware that the party would be held in their banquet hall. Despite the fact that he himself was worried, the young man tried to calm Adriana down and promised that he was thinking about further actions. The girl herself did not understand, but she believed Benjamin. She knew that he would do everything for her to be free. After calming down a bit, Adriana headed to the dining room, where the whole family was already waiting for her to have breakfast. Her parents looked as if nothing had happened yesterday at all. Michael was as serious as ever, doing his work at the table. Kathy looked at Adriana with a kind of reproachful look. Kathy, are you in some kind of trouble? Why are you looking at me like I owe you something? No, sister. I just look at you and I don't understand why you're so ungrateful. You marry Fox Jr. and you look like you're marrying Gorbunov. You're telling me you'd marry him with great pleasure. If I were you, wouldn't I? As it is, you realize I don't want to get married until I'm in the family business. Adriana just rolled her eyes. She had nothing to say to that. It didn't settle in her mind why she should be grateful to her parents for selling her out either. But nevertheless, the girl tried to make the most casual look possible, continued eating breakfast, and then went to get dressed to go to the establishment where the stylists and makeup artists were waiting for her. An hour and a half later, Adriana and Betty were already there. The girl once again walked through the Grand Michael Garden, which had fallen into her soul in her early childhood. Then she and Benjamin had run away from home to get there. The employees of the banquet hall knew that they came here secretly from their parents, but they never gave them up. They loved watching the kids and their admiring glances. Adriana stood near the fountain, remembering it all. A slight smile appeared on her face. Fifteen minutes later, Betty came running after her and grabbed her by the arm and dragged her inside. The woman was outraged that her daughter was being so irresponsible about tonight's event. Adriana didn't understand why there was such a rush. After all, it was more than three o'clock before the party. That would be enough time for the stylists and makeup artists to get all the guests in order. While Adriana got her feet behind Betty, she looked around to think of places to pull off the plan she and Benjamin had come up with. Fortunately, there were plenty of such places. Once she was sure of that, the girl calmed down and set off with peace of mind to see the stylist and makeup artists. In a small but well-staged room, two girls of pleasant appearance were waiting for her. They treated her very well. Every five minutes they checked if she liked everything. The girl loved to be treated like that by people. But unfortunately, she was 100% sure that this attitude was due to the status of her family, the status of her so-called fiancé. As Betty said, all the preparations for the party took three o'clock. Adriana was tired during that time, as if she had plowed the whole field of potatoes by hand. Her stylist and makeup artist wouldn't even let her go to the bathroom. They kept saying that they had very little time. The girl needed to tell Benjamin that she had found a few places that would help make their plans a reality. As soon as she rushed out to the restroom, she called Benjamin at once, telling him about the places she had reviewed. The young man listened attentively to his beloved, after which he said that she was a great girl and chose the right locations. The young man once again clarified from Tanya at what time she would organize the show so that he could prepare himself for this moment when they agreed on everything, Adriana hung up the phone. The girl only had to change her clothes. She knew her mother and stylist would not leave her alone. She needed to stash what Benjamin had given her yesterday. She pulled out a small roll of paper no larger than one by one centimeter and hid it in her bra. And she had purposely picked out a dress like this yesterday so she could wear it underneath. Once again, looking in the mirror, Adriana smiled to herself and whispered that everything would be fine and went to her mother's stylist. 
Upon entering the room, she was met with disgruntled looks from Betty and the young man who was apparently the stylist. The mother began to nag about Adriana's constant tardiness. The party might be disrupted because of her. The girl could not understand how the event could be disrupted because of her if the groom and his family went to great lengths to make it happen. Even if Adriana had been unconscious, she would have been picked up under both arms, glasses put over her eyes, and pretended to be fine. Dressed in the very dress Adriana had picked out last night, everyone in the room gasped. The outfit really looked great on the girl. It emphasized her beautiful curves. It hid any slight imperfections in her figure. Betty insisted that her daughter wear high heels. However, the girl was stubborn and said she would never wear them in her life. The dress was floor length, so any other shoes could be worn as they would not be visible. Betty waved at her daughter and told her to do as she saw fit. Adriana was glad that her mom gave in so quickly. It was important to her to wear the sneakers today. It would be much easier to carry out the plan she and Benjamin had in mind. When everyone was ready, she went to the window and noticed that there were already a lot of people standing near the gate. These people were clearly not invited to the event. They turned out to be reporters. The girl was pleased. They would help her escape. Cars were already pulling up to the parking lot one by one. Some of them I didn't know, but most of the cars were unfamiliar to her. At this point, Betty told her to get downstairs. It was necessary in order to greet the guests. There was no choice in the matter. So the girl agreed and immediately headed for the hall. Already in 15 minutes, the first guests came through the door. They turned out to be Adriana's aunt and uncle as well as their children. Relatives sincerely congratulated the girl on the engagement, were interested in how they managed with Jacob to hide their relationship. In response, not only thanked and smiled embarrassedly. The girl hoped that with this arrangement the guests would not have unnecessary questions or they would not demand an answer to the questions already asked. The aunt and uncle turned out to be very well-mannered, so they were satisfied with just a smile from their niece. Immediately after them, the guests started coming in one by one, and she didn't realize that the guests were coming in one by one. On her side, and on Fox's side, when all the guests had already entered, Adriana wondered why her so-called fiancé was still not there. At one point she felt like exhaling, thinking about maybe Fox had changed her mind about marrying her son to Adriana. As soon as that thought popped into her head, a man's hand slipped around her waist. God, Adriana, you look so beautiful today. No doubt you always look seductively strong. But today you have surpassed all my expectations. Let me kiss you. At this moment, the girl turned around and saw Jacob Fox standing in front of her. The young man did indeed look like a pompously turkey. She vaguely remembered him. Indeed, at one of the hangouts, the young man had approached her, trying to get to know her. Not that Adriana had rejected him at that moment, she just hadn't shown any particular interest. Hello, my lovely fiancé. Thank you for all the compliments you've paid me. The only thing you can kiss is my hand. You'll have access to everything else only after the wedding. Come on, Tanechka, we live in the 21st century. A bride and groom should try each other before the wedding. How can I marry you without sharing a bed with you? What if we're not right for each other in the same way? Jacob, if we're not right for each other, it's entirely your and your family's fault. You didn't expect me to jump right into bed with you after you and your father forced mine to sell me. No, sweetie. What if I'm still innocent? You see, darling, I've been saving myself all my life for my one and only husband. And as it happens, that's what you are. So you'll have to wait. But don't worry, it's only a week away. Oh, naughty girl. But that's okay. Right after the wedding, you and I will go to a hotel instead of a restaurant. And there I won't miss a single inch of your body that my fingers haven't touched. I'll explore all of you. I'll taste you in every way. You will be mine alone. Jacob hissed. I could hear the notes of anger and rage in his voice. He acted as if he were the hunter. And Adriana was his prey. After saying that, the girl smiled sweetly at him, 
kissed him on the temple, and turned to her parents to see their reaction. Of course, they had not heard what Jacob was saying to her. However, even a fool would have realized that there was a great tension between the two young people that was bound to come out sooner or later. Adriana was willing to tolerate exactly as long as Jacob kept his hands to himself. If it had been up to her, she would not have let him hold her this evening. But for the moment, she needed to blur the eyes of those around her. Everyone should think that they had been in love for a long time, hiding their relationship only because they were afraid of publicity. Wherever Adriana went, she was always followed by either her mother or Jacob. It is unclear for what reason they were afraid to leave her alone. Perhaps the fault of this behavior was that yesterday the girl tried to run away from home. But she was the only one who knew that she was going to leave for another city. The rest of us are just imagining it. Flanagan was also among the invited guests. Benjamin, of course, was not present. His parents were present at the party. Adriana noted what excellent actors they were. Both Benjamin's father and mother were so joyful. Their speeches sounded quite sincere, although Adriana then wondered if it was partly her own. You were really sincere. After all, thanks to the fact that the girl married Fox Jr., their business remained intact. And wasn't it painful to realize how rotten this world was? Time was running out. Time to get into action. Guests tried time and time again to personally approach Adriana and Jacob to congratulate them on their upcoming nuptials. Even if it was all for real, the girl would be very unpleasant because none of the invitees thought about the fact that she had basic human needs. She had been longing to go to the bathroom for the past hour and a half. When she and Jacob were approached by a married couple who were friends of the Fox family, Adriana did not hold back and said that she needed to go to the restroom. The guests were in a bit of shock, because such things are usually not said directly. But the girl no longer had the strength to humor and try to say some veiled phrases. Once in the toilet, Adriana decided to make sure that she was alone. After walking through all the stalls and not seeing a single person, she went to the door and turned the lock so that no one could enter. The girl walked over to the sink, leaning on it with her hands staring intently at her reflection in the mirror. Now she was facing the hardest choice of her life. Either she marries a man she doesn't know, or she takes a risk, and if successful, saves her life. Living with this pompous Manziuk Adriana had no desire to live with. Her hand reached for her chest, penetrating under the fabric of her dress. Quickly found the necessary paper roll. Adriana held it in her hand. She was very scared. There was no guarantee that everything would end up exactly as she and Benjamin had fantasized. Unwrapping the paper wrapper, the girl saw a pill with a slight guilty tinge to it. She needed, she needed to drink it. Her hands began to shake, but there was no way out. With a single movement of her hand, Adriana popped the pill into her mouth. With her other hand, she opened the faucet, leaned over and began to drink. There was an unpleasant taste in her mouth like most medications. The girl was afraid that the smell of the pill would be able to freak someone out, so she popped a lollipop into her mouth, which ended up in her shreds. The deed was done. Time to head to the gym. There wasn't much time left. The effects of the drug would kick in in 15 minutes. In that time, Adriana had to sneak to the balcony. There were five balconies in the hall located on the second floor, but she was not interested in all of them. She needed a specific one, the one on the left side of the entrance. It was perfect, but to get to it was much more difficult because on the way there was a bar behind which there were many guests who wanted to personally congratulate the future newlyweds with the upcoming wedding, and it was not necessary to send them all somehow culturally. The girl decided that she would refer to poor health. She was lucky because most of the guests took it with understanding. Almost every woman talked about feeling the same way before the wedding. Behind her, Jacob was once again fading behind her, clinging to her more and more tightly with each passing hour. She needed to get rid of him because she was to be alone on the balcony. All her arguments and requests were not taken seriously by the young man. Jacob finally came close to his dream, so he did not want to leave her for a second. 
he was afraid that he would lose her again. When Adriana and Jacob were already on the balcony, the girl felt a sharp deterioration of health. It turns out that it was visible even to those around them. On the face of Jacob appeared a kind of anxiety. Adriana, what is it? What's wrong with you? How can I help you? Jacob's voice sounded really anxious. Adriana was surprised that this man could have such feelings. She realized that now she had the only chance to carry out her plan. Bring some water, please. The girl barely squeezed out of herself. She was getting worse and worse by the second. She needed to get close to the necessary part of the balcony to stay where she was standing now. It only meant that the plan would be doomed to failure. Jacob gently let go of Adriana and jogged towards the bar to grab a bottle of cooling water. He didn't understand what was going on with the girl. She really did look very bad, even though she was fresher than everyone else at the beginning of the evening. As the young man tried to make his way to the bar, Adriana slowly but surely made her way to the right side of the balcony. Her consciousness behind the fog was fearful. She realized she was about to pass out. Her heartbeat became slower than usual. There was some extraneous noise in her ears. There were only a few seconds left. She could feel it. As she approached the balcony, she stepped a little over it. And after another two seconds, her eyes went black. Oh my God, call an ambulance. Jesus, poor girl, how did you do that? Have they started? There are voices coming from all over the banquet hall. All the guests had flocked to the balcony. All eyes were fixed on the lawn where the body of the so-called bride lay breathless. Betty and Ethan ran up to Adriana. Her mother was rubbing her shoulders, slapping her cheeks, trying to bring her daughter to her senses. Nothing worked, however. Betty became hysterical. Tears appeared in Ethan's eyes. The man grabbed his wife, dragged her away to the corner of the building where they began to sob together in an embrace. Jacob stood on the balcony and looked at the girl's body, and the expression on his face carried sadness and grief to those around him. He couldn't believe that his happiness was so close and left him forever. It's okay, Jacob. Don't worry. We'll find you a new wife. You found a beautiful woman. We have half of the invited guests ten times more beautiful than this, Adriana read. Noah Fox said in a cool voice. He wasn't surprised at all by what had happened. There was no sadness, grief, or sympathy on his face. The young man answered his father nothing, no matter what he said. Noah Fox would not have been taken seriously. By this time, an ambulance had pulled up to the establishment, and doctors ran out of it. They headed toward the body, and they bent over to feel for a pulse. They did a few more manipulations, and then they said, Time of death, 1939. After that, a woman's scream was heard. Betty became hysterical. The only thing she kept saying was what she had told Ethan about Adriana not being left alone. No one present said anything about the fact that it was because she had been sold. The paramedics loaded Adriana's body onto a stretcher and rolled her to the ambulance forward, feet first. Everyone at the party was shocked at what had happened. In another case, people would have had the idea that it was a suicide. However, things turned out a little differently. Everyone saw that Adriana had become drastically ill. Therefore, the only reason for what happened, they considered a loss of consciousness, from which she fell over the railing of the balcony and fell on the lawn. The ambulance went to the city hospital without hurry, because there was no hurry. At this time, Betty and Ethan were beating hysterically. Their son Michael tried to calm them down so that they could go to the hospital as quickly as possible. Somewhere in the back of his mind, he was holding out hope that she would be saved now. After all, he loved his sisters so much, especially the youngest, who was always cheerful, loving, kind. When Adriana was brought to the hospital, she was immediately taken to the morgue. There was no pathologist on site, so the paramedics handed the body over to the orderlies. Logically, she should have been immediately loaded into a refrigerator. But the men did not. The paramedics asked why they had left her on the table. The paramedics replied that a pathologist would be coming soon to perform an autopsy. This answer satisfied the medical staff, 
who fled in an unknown direction. When the order lies were left alone with Adriana's body, they immediately rushed to the desk. They opened the top drawer, which contained a syringe containing an unknown drug. They shouted to each other that there was no time to wait. It was necessary to do everything as quickly as possible. When one of the order lies found the syringe, the other ran up to the body and started looking for the vein on Adriana's arm. As soon as it was found, the needle pierced it and all the drug poured out of the syringe. After that, one of the paramedics started to perform artificial heart massage. After only two minutes, Adriana came to consciousness. The girl felt terrible. She had a pain in her head, back, left leg. Most likely, the injuries received after the fall from the balcony made themselves felt. When the girl opened her eyes, the paramedics began to rejoice as if she was their relative. One of the men grabbed his cell phone and started calling. Adriana could not make out his conversation, but the only thing she heard was the phrase she was fine. She was conscious. The girls helped her up, got up from the table, took her chair. In all this time, Adriana did not utter a single word. She just didn't have the energy for it. When her breathing evened out and her heartbeat returned to normal, one of the orderlies put a mug of strong and sweet tea on the table in front of her, and the other brought a plate with pies on it. You need to get your strength back. Eat your fill. This is all very serious. You've been through something that a lot of people don't wake up from. Let's face it, you took a very bad fall. You don't have a single fracture on you. However, the drug has weakened your body. Adriana reached for a mug of tea, made a few gladkov. She felt a pleasant warmth spread through her body. At that moment, the door to the morgue opened. A pathologist stood on the threshold. At the sight of Adriana, he staggered. The man had come to his workplace because he had been told that the corpse of a young woman had been brought in. He had no way of knowing that the corpse would suddenly come to life and drink tea with the orderlies. Don't worry, calm down. This is the girl we told you about yesterday. Did you forget? Oh my God, I really forgot about her. Honey, how are you feeling? Did you examine her? She doesn't have any fractures. No, she's fine. She turned out to be very lucky. To be honest, I thought their plan was doomed to fail. Apparently, she really didn't want to marry that kid. Adriana remained silent as her mouth was occupied with the pies, which at that moment were tastier than all the delicacies known in the world. She didn't yet fully know what was going on. When she and Benjamin had discussed the plan, the only part of the plan was the sound of it. The first part is the one that says that Adriana needs to specifically take a pill that will promote gradual cardiac arrest. It is because of this drug that the paramedic failed to recognize in her. It was because of this drug that the paramedic failed to recognize in her barely vulnerable pulse, which is why they pronounced her dead, and she did not know that she was to be brought to the morgue. However, she did not assume that his staff would be alerted to this. She was afraid to start talking because she felt like she would be immediately turned over to her parents as soon as they showed up on the hospital's doorstep. The orderlies kept talking among themselves, including the pathologist in the conversation. Sometimes, they marveled that in this day and age one could still find such situations where children were married to each other against their will. They called Adriana and Benjamin, the real-life Romeo and Juliet. Fifteen minutes later, Benjamin burst through the door of the morgue. When he saw his beloved alive and unharmed, sitting wanting a brownie, he threw himself at her feet. Grabbing her hands, he began kissing them, moving higher and higher and up to her lips. The young man whispered to Adriana about how much he loved her and that he would never let her go again in his life. Sweetheart, I realize you've been through something terrible, but we're running out of time. We have to run. Okay. Sighs. At that moment, Adriana let go of the cakes and the mug of tea. She got to her feet, staggered a little. Benjamin put his arm around her waist to help her walk to the car where she could change into normal clothes. It was a black designer dress, only drawing attention to herself. The young men said goodbye to the orderlies and pathologists, thanked them for their work and walked out. The car stood 10 meters away from the morgue. 
Adriana walked very slowly, as she had not yet had time to regain her strength. Benjamin picked up his lover in his arms and ran to the car. He put Adriana in the back seat so that she could change her clothes while on the road. He jumped behind the wheel and drove as fast as he could to escape from the city and then from the region. A happy life was ahead of them, with neither his nor her parents. That was the least of their worries, as in life you need to have people close to you who will never betray you.